flower. Okay, we are officially recording. Welcome everyone uh, to the third series for the Chambers for Sustainability webinar. It is such a pleasure. I see we have um, speaker, uh, past speakers coming in, other Chambers of Commerce. Um, and so we're just really, really happy to have everyone join us today. And so I wanna just uh, say thank you so much to our Chambers for Sustainability Coalition team. Today we're going to be having Amanda be our host. And so she will walk everybody through uh, the process and do the introduction. So thank you so much, Amanda. She is our uh, Chamber for Sustainability Coalition Manager. And then we also have Julie behind the scenes. So Julie is our communications and coordinator. Uh, and so she will be the person that if you have a question when it comes time to asking questions of our speakers, you will direct them to Julie um, and write them directly to her. So don't send them to me or don't send them to Amanda. I guess you can send them to Amanda as well, but um, Julie would be the primary person. And then Haley, who is our sustainability research and marketing associate, will be the person. If you have any challenges with getting on, um, getting back into the room, or, or just having any technical difficulties, please just reach out to her. So I'm going to go ahead right now and hand it over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, we invite each of you to join on building this exciting new coalition, which is a large reason why we decided to uh, in our series. If you would like to be a part of the first meetings or would like to know more information, please just send me an email to um, amanda at usgreenchamber.com. I'll be putting that in the chat as well. Um, and again, as Michelle had mentioned, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact Julie in the chat box. Um, and then I would first and foremost like to thank all of our speakers for joining our call today. Each of them are very accomplished and have largely contributed to the sustainability sector, either individually or through their chambers. Um, and if you would like to see their full biographies, they have been posted onto the Eventbrite for this webinar. Today, we will be having speakers from around the nation. We're excited to welcome the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, the Santa Fe Green Chamber in New Mexico, and the Jackson Hole Chamber from Wyoming. So our speaker today will be Christina Coleman from the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia. Christina. Uh, thanks, Amanda, and thanks for having me today. Um, as just said, my name is Christina Coleman, and I work with the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce. Um, I do their energy work, and I've been with the Philly Chamber for almost two years, and before that I worked with the Salt Lake Chamber and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So uh, it's, it's my third chamber. Um, I want to just, why, we'll go to the next slide really quick. Um, I want to just briefly go over a little introduction of the Chamber of Commerce for Greater Philadelphia. Um, our chamber is a regional chamber, and we represent members across the 11 county region of Greater Philadelphia, and that encompasses southeastern PA, southern New Jersey, and northern Delaware. Uh, before the pandemic, we had we put on over 300 events a year, um, and while that number has has dwindled right now, I, I'm proud to say that we've been able to successfully pivot most of those events um, to virtual. We're certainly looking forward to in-person opportunities in 2021. Um, our chamber is made up of four councils, which support our mission. Um, those councils are the Arts and Business Council, CEO Council for Growth, Select Greater Philadelphia, and the Young Professionals Council. And if we go to the next slide really quick, um, I obviously, I'm still new to Philly, frankly. I like to show this map. Um, we are the three-state chamber. Um, we believe that our economy is interconnected between Delaware, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. Everything is together, um, and our advocacy and work reflect that. So we go on to the next slide here. Um, under the Chamber CEO Council for Growth, we have industry-specific groups, uh, what we call action teams, and those are focused on areas of our economy with the biggest impact. So I have been managing Chambers Greater Philadelphia Energy Action Team for about two years, and, and we call this GPEAT, a lot of acronyms here at the Philly Chamber. Um, GP brings together over 150 industry executives across our region committed to delivering affordable clean energy solutions that benefit our families and businesses living and operating in our region. Um, it is our longest standing, what we call action team. And it, since its conception in 2014, it has evolved into a diverse group of stakeholders across the energy spectrum comprised of utilities, 
um, energy efficiency, renewable, nuclear, and natural gas generation. Our current chairs are John Walsh, the President and CEO of UGI Corporation, and Craig White, the President and CEO of PGW. Um, I've outlined here on the slide just the goals of GP that have been developed by our membership that steer our work on a daily basis. And those include driving economic development, promoting solutions that enable an affordable, diverse, low carbon energy system, advancing best practices and programs for safe and sustainable energy production, encouraging the implementation of technologies that increase energy efficiency, reliability, and resilience, and then supporting the transition towards a low carbon regional transportation sector. Um, I always like to just point out again, Greater Philadelphia Energy Action Team is uh, unique in that it encompasses um, a very diverse uh, set of people and we are uh, driven by two natural gas CEOs, but what we do is, is in, try to find ways to work together across the industry um, to advance sustainability. So on the next slide here, um, we just outlined, you know, some of the ways we work alongside our members to advance those goals that I had brought up. And really first and foremost for us is engagement and collaboration with our members. Um, GP convenes its members on a monthly basis through meetings and on specific smaller working groups. Um, really our goal is to foster collaboration among members across the energy spectrum to support clean energy infrastructure projects, identify new partnerships and business opportunities. Uh, through our network, we're able to connect companies um, to utilities, engineers, and industry experts across the region to advance those projects and objectives. And I think most meaningful is our ability to convene executives from natural gas industry, electric, nuclear, um, and renewables all around the table to have meaningful conversations around what their companies are doing. Um, and also to discuss emerging ideas from hydrogen and renewable natural gas to microgrids and energy efficiency technologies. And, and we're doing that still remotely right now, but we've been doing that for the last um, six years on a monthly basis. And then one of the other things that we focus on in GP is, is obviously advocacy um, for projects and policies that align with our group's goals to advance a low carbon energy future. Um, this year, we're continuing to advocate for Pennsylvania Senate Bill 596, and that's the Clean Transportation Act. Um, we're hopeful it might pass this session and that creates a framework under the PUC for building clean transportation infrastructure and, and we have those utilities on board with supporting that bill. Um, we've also supported government grant funding requests for things like um, one of the largest solar arrays in the city that's being developed to power a new LNG facility in downtown Philadelphia. Uh, another priority for us is building awareness of the region's industry and its impacts for greater Philadelphia and we do this focused on policymakers broader business community and then just the community as a whole. Um, last year, GP partnered with international engineering firm Ramble uh, for their SPARK competition, which is a 24 hour think tank style competition created for college students uh, to solve real world challenges in the areas of advanced manufacturing, energy and water. Uh, we convened our members to develop a regional energy focused problem statement for students. And as part of the challenge, GP members asked students to assume that they we're a state policy team tasked with developing a vision and path forward for Pennsylvania's carbon emission goals. And we also asked them to develop that vision, understanding how to balance safety, reliability, affordability, and sustainability. And what was great about that is that um, our member uh, utilities and energy generation companies were able to connect with students um, in our, uh, sorry, in our local colleges to discuss the industry, the solutions that we're trying to implement and how they can be part and enter into the industry. Um, one other project that, that we've just launched is called Energy at Work. Um, it aimed at highlighting advancements taking place in the sector that are increasing efficiency, resiliency, lowering energy costs and reducing carbon emissions for the broader business community. Uh, we wanted to bring these types of projects closer to home, so we released two publications featuring project case studies from our members across the region, demonstrating the commitment of the broader business community to increasing energy efficiency and reducing their carbon footprint. And as part of that initiative, we host a series of workshops featuring our GP members to educate policymakers and business leaders on how businesses and government can make immediate investments to lower their carbon emissions and save money for their bottom lines. So lastly, I just always highlight, you know, our priority as part of um, a membership of energy organizations is to support business attraction and retention in our region. Um, and our, our utilities are connected and help to facilitate new business development um, with our business attraction council within the chamber. And we're always trying to find ways to support those businesses, both 
finding new energy solutions to reduce their carbon emissions, um, and ensuring that they're able to stay in the region for those reasons. Um, I, I guess I'll go to the next slide really quick and just briefly show, kind of small, but that's just one of the examples of the Energy at Work publication and a couple of the case studies that we share. Um, one being Energy Energy Headquarters and the other being um, a township in New Jersey that decided to put solar array to power its school district and government buildings. Um, and we, what's important about that we find is to also outline the utilities contributions and ensuring that there's money um, towards these projects, making them more financially feasible for businesses. And, and that's a big part of what Energy at Work is, is our ability to connect our membership to utility grants and opportunities and make it financially feasible for them to make those investments. So I guess I'll just end um, by saying I encourage, we've been encouraged in the past by the effort of our region's energy industry to convene and work together, um, address issues and continue to find ways to increase sustainability within their businesses. And I think GP has helped facilitate those opportunities. And I would encourage other chambers to explore opportunities to engage um, a, di a diverse group of energy industry leaders in their community like we did. So I'll stop there and, and thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, I love that your chamber emphasizes the relationship between energy economy and the impact of COVID-19. I know you guys recently had a virtual meeting on that. Um, I think it's especially important for business members right now as um, although everything else seems to be burning quite literally, um, nature is semi-flourishing. So that is always good. <laughs> Um, our next speaker will be Glenn Schiffbauer, I believe is how it's pronounced, um, from the Santa Fe Green Chamber in New Mexico. Glenn? Uh, thank you, Anne. and yes, you pronounced it perfectly. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share what we've been doing in Santa Fe and New Mexico with this group. Uh, I started the Santa Fe Green Chamber of Commerce about eight years ago, and uh, in that time, I think I believe we've evolved into an organization that doesn't necessarily operate uh, the way a typical Chamber of Commerce does. In Santa Fe, we've got about 110,000 people in this area, and we've got three Chambers of Commerce. Um, we've got the Green Chamber, we have the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and we have um, the traditional Chamber, which my wife calls the real Chamber of Commerce when she wants to get under my skin. Um, so. We've taken on the niches of the business voice for sustainability here as a part of this community. But also I think what's happened is that we've garnered some attention from different groups and industries outside of Santa Fe that are looking for representation in New Mexico. And I think that sets us apart from the other chambers and how they've been operating here. And it's given us an opportunity to tell the story and the sustainability story of Santa Fe and uh, the state of New Mexico on a national level. If you look at the, the slide there, that's one of our programs, which was Methane Matters. So you can go ahead to the next one too. Um, go. In 2014, NASA discovered a methane cloud over the Four Corners area in the West. And you can see that hot spot uh, inside the square there where Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico meet. It's the only place in the country where four four states meet in one spot. Um, methane is not only a, a health and environmental hazard there, but it's also a valuable resource. And it's a resource that belongs to the state of New Mexico and its citizens. I mean, like Pennsylvania, like Wyoming, we're very dependent on our oil and gas industry. So anytime you start looking at changes or asking for them to step up to make some changes, it's kind of dicey. You know, here in New Mexico, since they're such a big part of our budget, a lot of times the what you get is, you know what, we, we're contributing a lot. If you just uh, thank us and leave us alone, we really, we'd really like you to do that. Um, <clears throat> but as you can see with that spot in the Four Corners area, that's about roughly the size of the state of Delaware. And it was determined that that was all caused by flaring and venting and leaking at the gas, uh, at the oil heads, at the wells themselves. So in a poor state like New Mexico, we can't really afford to lose any methane. So we can't waste it. Each year there's about $275 million of wasted 
uh, natural gas in the form of venting, leaking, or venting. That costs the state of New Mexico about $40 million that could be going towards public education or any other services. As I said, we're a poor state, just can't do that. Yeah, you can see uh, from this slide that it's um, pretty prevalent throughout the West that there's a lot of gas loss. So with environmental and um, health issues, if you're not living in the area of the oil fields, it's not really something that's prevalent and on your mind. But if you, as a, uh, a business organization, we were able to carry that message and we can get that to everybody in New Mexico and make them realize that this is um, something that's infected, affecting everyone. It's not just you know, the, the clean air that you're missing out on, it's revenue. Towards that end, we were able to pull together a bigger coalition using some of the environmental law groups, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, NRDC. And in 2016, we were able to get President Obama to sign a methane rule uh, pertaining to tribal and public lands. Uh, it had a, a life, uh, <laughs> it had a life of about four months before the new administration came in and pretty much gutted that rule. So what we're working on now with a lot of other states is to put in place rules on methane on public lands on a state-by-state -state basis. So we're hopeful that we can uh, continue uh, making strides that way. Another way our organization, I think, tried to help that's different than some others on a statewide basis is to help businesses become more sustainable and to find a path to that. And one of the re ways we determined was to help them become um, a designated benefit corporation. Now, I started uh, a bill seven years ago, and, and finally this year in 2020, uh, I carried it, we passed it, the governor signed it. When I started, we would have been the 14th benefit corporation state. Uh, we're now the 37th. So there are a lot of states that have really adopted this um, way of incorporating their businesses. And just briefly, if you're unfamiliar with benefit corporations, a benefit corporation, uh, it takes into account that business can do good. Okay. Use the power of business to impact positive social and environmental changes. Uh, your traditional corporation is um, held to a fiduciary duty to maximize profit. A benefit corporation doesn't necessarily have to do that so they can make adjustments into their mission in order for them to take into account not just their shareholders, but all stakeholders. So for instance, anybody who is impacted by your business in the area that you're doing business, you have to take that into account to become a benefit corporation. And the reason that that is important is it was found by major companies that, that um, normal corporations attribute about 55% of their profits to external costs. In other words, the consumer, the uh, populace as a whole are taking on the external costs, whether it be health or environmental, and allowing those companies to uh, have a profit that's really only about half of what it should be because we're absorbing those costs. And as things have grown with social impact investing, investing and ESG investment funds, uh, which have grown from about six trillion to 12 trillion in the last five years, we thought that there was a great opportunity for our uh, tech and agriculture sectors. That's about all we have. We don't have any manufacturing for, to speak of in New Mexico. We do have, however, two national laboratories that are continually spinning off tech transfer businesses. So we wanted another arrow in that quiver to get them to stay here. We found that millennials not only get the concept of your business should be doing business for the good of all, but they treat it as a given, it's expected. It's also expected of the people they do business with. So we've got that signed in, we've already started getting people to incorporate that way and we're hoping to see some growth over the next year. We've partnered with the University of New Mexico's graduate school uh, in order to help people go through that process of becoming a benefit corporation. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, and finally, as an organization, we wanted to uh, 
take a position of not just educating our businesses and our members on sustainability, but actually bringing it into the business itself. In Santa Fe, we have community challenges when it comes to growth, um, whether it be business or population. We annually get about 12 inches of rain per year. We are going through a drought. So everybody, we have the climate uncertainty. Santa Fe competes with St. Augustine about who's the oldest city in the country, but nevertheless, we have aging infrastructure here. Uh, we're a city that's 400 plus years old. And we're also um, a place that's attractive to people to move to, and especially I mean, <laughs> our real estate is, is off the charts now during COVID. People want to come to a smaller city they like our climate, uh, despite the fires we're having now. And uh, it's just an untenable situation if we don't take care of our water. The city of Santa Fe itself has a long history of water conservation. We have the lowest per capita water usage in the West, but it really hadn't reached the commercial sector until we started a partnership with the city of Santa Fe and with the Santa Fe Community College. In our pilot project, we took on 30 restaurants that were recruited by the Green Chamber. We did audits and worked, um, uh, we did assessments and gave them reports on what they could do to save water in their operations. In our initial pilot, we saved 450,000 gallons of water just by changing out the aerators on sinks. And that was just in 30 restaurants. So we've got over 300 here and we're working on getting those all on board for this program. Because as you can see, it's, it's uh, also a marketing campaign. It's a promotional campaign that highlights that Santa Fe is a very sustainable city and that our restaurants are participating in that. Uh, we are projecting that as we go forward, that our projected water savings with the restaurant program is going to be more like 22 million gallons, which is a lot of water for a, a dry city like us. And in addition to promoting the restaurants and conserving the water that we need, which, you know, as Christina pointed out, you start this conservation of energy and water and make that message that that goes to your bottom line, then there's a lot of uptake on that. But we were able to create um, a training program through our community college where people become certified water auditors. So we've created a job sector uh, that helps along with the educational component, along with the conservation. And because of that program, uh, Santa Fe was named the 2020 most sustainable mid-sized city in the country by the Green Building Media Coalition. So sorry, this was the third second remaining notice. <laughs> okay, that's fine. And we are moving that into the energy efficiency. We're going to replicate that whole program uh, going into businesses and recruiting them. And just like in Philadelphia, or, yeah, Philadelphia, energy efficiency is very important to the bottom line. And that's all I've got. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And look forward to hearing more. Thank you so much, Glenn. I mean, clearly your chamber cares deeply for resource conservation, and I'd like to commend you for all the efforts, especially considering the fact that uh, New Mexico seems to be suffering from fire smoke from what seems like every direction. I didn't realize <laughs> that it was the only point in the states that had four states. So that was a little fun fact I, I just learned, so that's cool. Um, our next speaker will be Rick Howe from the Jackson Hole Chamber in Wyoming. Uh, Haley, did you want to turn on his video and mic? Oh, he's already on. Awesome. Rick? I'm on. <clears throat> um, I'll just start out with a little bit of an introduction for those of you that haven't been to Wyoming. So most of you probably have more people in your cities than we do in our entire state. So at the last census, our state population was about 516,000. Our mule deer population was 550,000. So we have more mule deer than people. And in the town of Jackson, Wyoming, which we operate in what's called Teton County, we have the largest elk herds in North America. We also are within one of the world's um, only intact ecosystems, which is the Yellowstone ecosystem. Jackson Hole is four miles. So my office is four miles from the south entrance to Grand Teton National Park. My office is 54 miles 
south of Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone, most people are aware, was the first national park in the world. And for us, it has always been a little bit challenging in Jackson, Wyoming. I've been here for 38 years now because it seems like there had always been this little bit of conflict between business and preservation. And from the Jackson Hole Chamber of Commerce's standpoint, we've always really thought that the power of place is what keeps our economy strong. Without our ability to preserve the band of Rocky Mountains and that incredible ecosystem in order for us to go into the future with a strong economy, especially during COVID now, so I'll give you a story about that in a moment, is we had to be able to work in tandem with the environment. About 10 years ago, um, there was a gentleman named Tim O'Donohue, who was uh, one of our previous executive directors, transitioned into a foundation called the Riverwind Foundation. The Riverwind Foundation looked at different ways that businesses could work in harmony with the environment so that the intended outcome is not only is the environment improved, but businesses are improved. In other words, their bottom line. So when you look at that triple bottom line, the profit and the planet piece work hand in hand for us. And uh, go to the next slide, please. So for us, here are a number of different initiatives that have happened that we've been recognized for, and I'll explain uh, each a little bit. Uh, we, we just received the Jackson Hole, uh, received the Silver Earth Check certification. It's the first destination in North America to receive this. And what it was, was it was a series of about five years of checks. And these checks had everything from how businesses were handling their waste to the cleaning products, to their emissions that they, um, whether it was from snowmobiles, from vehicles. Our Jackson Hole Airport actually just received recognition, uh, one of the top recognitions in the world for their initiatives. They have installed um, electric plug-ins around the airport parking facilities. We have airport, we have uh, plug-ins around our town square, plug-ins throughout the town. So taking things from fossil fuel into the future, whether that be wind turbines, whether that be electric. Jackson Hole Climate Action Collective, um, the Global Sustainable Tourism Council bronze certification received in 2012. The RRR Business Leader Program, which is Reduce, Reuse, Recycle, the BEST Program, and National Geographic, we received finalists for the World Legacy Awards in 2007. The next slide, I'll explain some of these a little bit more. The Silver Check Earth Silver Earth Check Certification, sorry. Um, Jackson Hole is the first travel and tourism destination to be Earth Check certified in North America. Earth Check is the world's leading scientific benchmarking certification and advisory group for travel and tourism. Earth Check Sustainable Destinations Program is designed to empower local communities to take ownership of sustainability goals and build local initiatives. Keystown County was evaluated on 266 criteria in 12 key performance areas, including energy efficiency, conservation, eco-conservation, waste management, cultural and social management, and economic management. Next slide, please. The RRR Business Leaders Program. Uh, it's a training and recognition program for Teton County businesses, nonprofits, and government agencies. For nearly a decade, the program has provided outreach, education, and recognition for local organizations wishing to reduce waste, conserve energy, make a positive community and environmental impact, reduce costs, and increase revenue. There are currently 170 members and over 15 annual certified events, which means we have national events. We are getting ready to go in to what's called our Fall Arts Festival, which we've held for 37 years. And that will draw in thousands of people. Certainly it's been modified due to COVID this year, but because of our ability to manage this prior to this year, we can still hold the event because we don't have the waste output. We don't have the groups of people that many events would typically have. There are a group of hot shots that go into any business that wishes to be part of this that will evaluate any business and transition them from a consumption-based business to an, a preservation-based business. Um, next, please. 
Jackson Hole Climate Action Collective. Uh, the Climate Action Collective was created to help Teton County reduce its carbon emissions and address climate change impacts. We envision a future without catastro catastrophic climate change and we will work to make Jackson Hole a vital player in creating the future for all. The organization is made up of volunteers, formed action committees, and local officials whose overachieving goal is to achieve a net zero carbon emissions for Teton County by the year 2030. We have three major ski areas within our county. All three areas are part of the collective initiative, which is reducing waste, reducing emissions based upon their operations on a daily basis. Um, next, please. The Chamber of Commerce. We operate four, four visitor center locations and we carry more than 54 resources in those locations dedicated to energy reduction, water conservation, waste reduction and recycling, green purchasing, wildlife conservation and transportation management. We will engage in all locations with over 550,000 people each year. All of the pre-planning and in-person Conversations involve education on ways to reduce environmental and resource impacts prior to arriving. Um, before I go next is we have on our website, if you went to jacksonholechamber.com, you would see a number of sustainability initiatives that we message to folks as we're going through those pages. These are things like if you're traveling for a, um, for instance, a family reunion, while you all may be driving in, while you're here, get a van. And in that van, you travel around daily. Don't bring in paper towels. Get a box of reusable and washable rags. Um, many of the hotels in the area have installed automatic um, energy reduction by where it's a motion sensor. And when someone leaves the room, even if they have their heat or their cold on what's higher than it should be in any season, it automatically adjusts. We let people know that in advance. There are so many things that we can do in advance of anybody coming. We also realize that, again, being the birthplace of conservation, for us, the ability to send people home with ideas after they've come here that says, wow, we can do any of that because we visited Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It's our idea, not just again, to be a numbers game of how many people can we get here. It's also how many people can we send home with that conservation and environmentally minded uh, culture after they've left here. Next, please. In 2019, the Jackson Hole Chamber of Commerce reached what's called the Business Emerald Sustainability Tier, which is best level of sustainability performance. The standards and best program are comparable to the world's most rigorous and comprehensive environmental community and economic sustainability criteria. Teton County, Wyoming in the year uh, 2019, we, uh, the impacts of tourism in our community received were $1.2 billion in spending. For a community of 24,000 people, that's incredible. And for us, our ability to, again, transition some of that thought process and have people think about what they can take home with them, whatever that may be, a resource, a behavior, a conversation, um, was so important to us that we, went for this certification, we achieved this, and now in all of our locations, we have this proudly displayed as we will the Silver Earth Check certification. Um, next, please. Um, and with us, again, all we can say is the ability to look to the future, and as many of the other states here have talked about, our fossil fuel uh, activity is really what sustained the state of Wyoming for over a hundred years. We now are encouraging all of the, uh, so the IOM after my name stands for Institute for Organization Management. I'm also on the faculty for that program. I go around our state um, and states surrounding us and talk to chambers of commerce and businesses about transitioning to a new future. We are currently working with our energy producing companies in Wyoming, whether those be coal companies, oil companies, getting involved with their conversations about how they're looking at the future. Wyoming, if you were to look at it as a separate country, is number three in the world 
in energy production when it comes to oil and coal production. We all know where those are going um, as far as the future goes. We also know that boards of those very companies are looking at ways they can transition. The last point I'll make to that is Saudi Arabia in 2016 invested $7 trillion in non-fossil fuel energy development and creation. If the number one producing country in the world is doing that, we ought to be taking notice. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Rick. That was amazing. I would firstly like to congratulate you as I saw that you guys are the first county in Wyoming to adopt zero waste, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. That's incredible. And I hope, I hope, hope, hope that the rest of the nation and world will quickly follow. Um, and I believe that concludes all of our speakers for today. I would like to thank all of the panelists for sharing their wonderful initiatives. I believe that with the implementation of programs like this, uh, we can achieve a more sustainable environment because us chambers, we hold a lot of influence. I think a lot more than people lead us out to be and it affects our business members and inherently also affects the communities we're in. So with this, we can truly change the mindset uh, of our society. I would now like to begin the Q&A. So Haley, if you could please unmute all of the speakers. And I will be relaying some questions from the chat box. Awesome. So I guess I will begin with a more generic question aimed towards all of you. So all of you may um, answer whenever you would like. Um, what is the top change you have implemented to support your members during the time of COVID-19? And with that, what is your top success story that brings economic success to your members? I, get, I can go first. Okay. I can speak to that. Um, I'll start by saying I, I manage a very small vertical within the chamber. Um, so I'd be speaking on behalf of my other colleagues by saying that our chamber convened, I believe, I want to say about eight very specific groups um, that represented, you know, a diverse set of from small business um, to healthcare uh, of individuals to come together to come up with the five things that our region should be doing, um, not just for recovery, but rebuilding our mm -hmm. economy. Um, so that was a six week process of facilitating interviews. Uh, the committees met, I think about three or four times and they had to take, you know, 50 suggestions, bring it down to a priority of five that can be implemented in the short term and then what can be implemented in the next two to three years to make that difference. So I think that was important because it was a partnership with our city and the chamber to facilitate that. It was a lot of work on my colleagues behalf on making sure that was reflective of our really diverse business community. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we're hopeful that we can, we have a roadmap moving forward. It's not just about getting business restarted, but what can we do now to start recovery too? And so we will be launching that in the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. I love that forwards thinking. Uh, Rick or Glenn, if you would like to speak to that. Sure, I'll go. Is uh, What we did is uh, immediately when uh, we saw what was happening and there was external um, uh, metrics that really dictated from our public health, not only state, but nationally, that there, uh, there be some action taken. What we did is formed uh, an economic recovery task force. That task force was made up of federal land partners. So people from Yellowstone, people from Grand Teton, all uh, of our elected officials that wish to be part of it are public health our hospital system because managing those beds was crucial to success moving forward. And what we did is we held a series of 116 meetings in about 10 weeks and we divided 216 businesses into sectors, had them create their own plans based upon a tiered system of red, orange, uh, yellow and green. So those four systems which allowed us to operate back and forth based upon what the metrics were dictating upon the health. So for us, once we were able to reopen and those metrics dictated we could do so, once and we knew there would be an outbreak so for us we knew that people had been isolated and cooped for a long time we realized that anytime there's been any kind of an issue either nationally or worldwide ours is an area that people want to come to um, we didn't know that would happen with this but based upon previous behavior it did so we opened up and we actually saw visitation at record levels when we first opened up 
everybody was a little bit anxiety driven because certainly nobody knew what was going to happen. But because of the protocols that we put in place, um, masks and all of the procedures that everybody was given in partnership with public health in each individual sector that came up with their own operation system because of that. And what I mean by that is we had activity providers, meaning um, our whitewater rafting companies, our horseback operators, our ranches, our lodges, our, uh, our restaurants that all came up with their own individual plan then that was reviewed with public health who altered it based upon what was needed to be able to keep people health and safe. When we first opened up, we had a pretty severe outbreak. We called a meeting within an hour, we had 96 of those partners. So there was a focus group, then task force, those 96 members of the task force created action items that we implemented the next day. In 10 days, we reduced our outbreak by 80%. So we've been able to stay open and maintain that success of being open since that point. Then your second piece of what have we been able to assist people with beyond that from an economic standpoint, when the CARES Act was released, um, we assisted our community in accessing over $60 million of that funding assistant and then helping them with a plan moving forward of what they should be looking at based upon, again, uh, metrics that we've never had before. Nobody's ever been in a pandemic and anybody that's alive today that we know of anyways. And, and how are we going to move forward together? So it's not about, we have just about 900 members and what we're operating under the premise of is nobody should be out there alone. If you have a question, we're delivering PPE. If it's a mom and pop business and they're open all day, we actually accessed and received over 600,000 masks and about 200 bottles of sanitizer and cleaning equipment that has the um, uh, requirements. And what we're doing is delivering if we need. We've changed our complete base of what we will do just to make sure that it, we're allowing everybody to stay open and giving them the resources necessary. Oh, I love that. That's very sweet. <laughs> um, Glenn, did you want to speak to this or? Yeah, just briefly, I can be, you know, as, um, as Rick mentioned, and, and we are experiencing the same thing, we are such a tourist uh, dependent community. Our, you know, our state may be oil and gas, but Santa Fe is pure tourism. And we also have a governor who has been uh, a secretary of health and she clamped down immediately. That's helped us in terms of our caseload and our, uh, our positivity is our, our, our spread rate is about 0.7 now we're one of the lowest in the west but from an economic standpoint just as i'm sure you experienced in jackson it's been devastating to hotels and restaurants and we have um, started a task force along with the city and the health care providers we have been out on the streets getting masks to businesses initially we were a resource for the PPP and the eyelid programs because again, these mom and pop stores, you know, they, they had this deer in the headlight look. They didn't know what they were going to do and they didn't know how to do it. And they were trying to keep their business open. And just that extra effort of trying to get some funding to do that was really overwhelming to them. So we were hopeful that with our group, we were able to um, provide that kind of help. We've also instituted and become a pilot for a, an app called Novid, which is a, kind of a contact tracing thing that we're getting out to our members that you can use on your cell phone. Very nice. And would those be in, implemented into like businesses for employees or how exactly was that implemented? The app itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it just the community as a whole, but it's um, it's been it's a it's a tricky situation in Santa Fe because we have a great many uh, employees in the hospitality business, like I think in any community, that don't necessarily want to be as easily accessible and trackable as they might on a smartphone. But yeah. still, it, 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 it lets you know in an anonymous way if there has been a positive case in the area. So it's very we're cool. seeing, we just started it last week, so we're seeing what the uptake is. Very cool, very cool. Um, I believe Michelle wanted to hop in briefly. 
Yeah, I, I just wanted to offer, um, because of some of the programs that you have, Rick, in Jackson Hole, and I think Glenn and maybe even Christina, uh, Carrie Hamlin from the Las Cruces Chamber spoke last week, but I just wanted her to jump in really quickly, if one of our team members could unmute her and put her on camera, to just talk about a national parks program that she's been very um, instrumental in implementing. So I think it would be very helpful. Ah, thank you. Oh, sh sure. Well, thank you, Michelle, and I appreciate it. And Rick, um, we may have met a couple of years ago at the SHIFT conference. Uh, I was a panelist up there talking about the connections between local economies and protected public lands and our, our public spaces. And it was, uh, I, I remember distinctly because of the six inches of snow um, that took place while I was up there. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful country. And, and one of the things that, um, because right now, especially during the pandemic, Rick, you're talking about this and Glenn as well and Christina, is that, you know, people are, are going outdoors a lot more um, because they can do so in a safe manner. And uh, one of the things that we've done, and Glenn, we've done this with the Rio Grande Gorge uh, as well, is be able to make that connection between local economies and protected public lands and our public spaces. And we did that with a marketing toolkit. And that's what I spoke about, Rick, up at Shift. And the zero waste uh, efforts, I still have my stainless steel Shift mug. Um, that I use for cocktails on a regular basis because it's a really good thing at keeping things cold. Um, and so a couple of things that we did was really uh, help businesses become kind of thoughtful stewards of these public lands by creating products that were named after um, our different spaces. So we have, you know, we have Oregon Mountains, Desert Peaks. We have the OMDP coffee blend. We have the OMDP cocktail, um, OMDP bread pudding, OMDP cupcakes. Um, stuff like that. And we also created um, the first of its kind Girl Scout patch that you can see. This is a Girl Scout patch that is specific for the National Monument. And Girl Scouts love their patches and families like going to communities to get those patches. And each individual Girl Scout Council has the authority to create these patches. So even if it's not about public lands, if it's about renewable energy, Christina, that might be something to think about as well, is that if you reach out to your local chapters, you can present an idea of creating this. And then you have earned media opportunities because, oh my goodness, Girl Scouts learning about how that they can reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, you know, it's a great media opportunity. In our case, it was a great media opportunity for Girl Scouts getting the, the OMDP patch, first of its kind national monument patch. But we have talked to businesses about ways to become thoughtful stewards uh, of their public spaces. And um, right now, especially when people are going outdoors because they can't go into businesses or closed environments, that's becoming much more important. Uh, and so if there are any opportunities, if you want to have a conversation, um, I'm more than happy to do so. How was that, Michelle? Was that Sorry. With Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. I really appreciate it. I just thought that that fit in. And we do have a recording of our last program with Carrie on it. So we will go ahead and share that with everybody so they can see a more uh, developed presentation as well, because it was, I think it was really helpful. And we've had a lot of um, other chambers ask about that program. So, so cool. thank you so much. Yeah. And um, any last um, items? Do any of the speakers have questions of each other before we move on? Oh, no? just thanks, and it's nice to yeah. nice to meet everybody. Oh, perfect, perfect. And Haley, do you want to bring up um, just the, the slides? Okay, perfect. Um, oh, let me turn my video on. So, I wanted to make just a couple of quick announcements before we leave. Uh, as a coalition, we're going to hold our very first coalition meeting where we're going to start bringing everybody together. Amanda and Haley and Julie and Nancy and the entire coalition team have only really been working on this for a few months. And um, as, as I'll show you, it's grown so fast. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, of power here. As I listen to these presentations, I know that I, I'm thinking of the, some of the chambers who even aren't here from some of the prior ones who I know will want to hear this. So, so fortunately, we are uh, recording all of these. If you are interested in um, speaking, if you're one of the listeners, um, or if you're interested in joining the coalition, 
please you know, reach out to Amanda. I'll, um, I have her email right here. At the end of this presentation, um, sometime probably next week, Julie will be sending a survey out. So we want to get your feedback on the coalition, on the presentations that we have. Um, go ahead, next slide. So this is just a um, just an overall of who has come into our coalition since we started just a few months ago. And um, we have the San Francisco Chamber. So we initially, we thought, let's start within the United States. And you know, let's let's be successful in that in that space right there. But right away, we had international chambers reaching out to us saying, "Hey, you know, like bring us in. You know, we need the same you know the same opportunity." And we also realized we can learn so much. I mean, we've been working in the in the international realm for quite a while as the U.S. Green Chamber. So we said, yes, you know, let's go ahead and bring in those international chambers. So we, we do have um, the, uh, that's the German Mexican chamber in addition. So next slide there. Metro Atlanta, great presentation. One of our first chambers that came on was the National City Chamber out of California. Um, we have the North Florida Green Chamber chapter coming on to the coalition. Uh, thanks to Carrie, we have the Las Cruces Green Chamber, and um, I think it was last time we had the speaker from Blair County Chamber, and this was really, this was really inspiring because he is the, they are the only chamber um, within their state that has any, wants anything to do with sustainability, and he keeps trying to talk the other chambers into, you know, like, this is not just good you know, kind of PR, this is really good for your members and he has yet to be successful. So I think together we hope that we can really inspire each other through the different programs that we're putting out and that we're sharing with each other. This could also be a particularly good introduction for Christina and Joe, because considering they're both in Pennsylvania and he said he felt very alone in the sustainability aspect, but wow. I guess he could look to your chamber. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> and I think he, where Blair County is, I'll be honest. <laughs> and, and I think he was talking to the smaller counties. So, okay, yeah, so that's, yeah. um, go ahead. Next slide. Uh, the British, I think we have Susanna on the call from the British um, Argentine Chamber of Commerce from the UK. Uh, again, another one of our first chambers that came in was the Arizona Green Chamber. Sorry for that logo. Go ahead. And I just put us last. Um, so we really, we felt as a national chamber and the Camera Verde de Comercio um, out of uh, Colombia is a national chamber of commerce as well. We've been collaborating with them for at least five years. It's been such an inspiring collaboration and we've learned so much from each other. We work together, we promote each other. And so we looked at that and said, well, we're just two chambers. Like, why, why aren't we bringing everybody into the mix? And, and I think, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. I think what we've learned from this after each, even though this is the third uh, webinar that we put together, I cannot tell you the number of introductions that as Amanda has been able to make to, to each other through different chambers, through the speakers, um, through the listeners and saying, I want to know more about that program. We want to implement. And I know even just as an example, Arizona, the Green Chamber, Arizona Green Chamber said, we're already implementing some of the programs that we heard on prior webinars, even though it's only been a month and a half, you know, since we've gotten started. So, and I know hearing from each of you, um, Glenn and Christina and Rick, these are really amazing programs. I mean, I've been taking notes on every, you know, every single program that you're putting out there. And it's us coming together and saying, what, you know, how can we put together a package so where we can make all chambers? You know, chambers have been around since 1599. There's at least 4,000 chambers in the United States that um, have at least a full-time staff. There's 13,000 registered chambers around the world. There's chambers of commerce in every single country in the world. So we have this amazing opportunity to change the, the face of sustainability within the business community. 
And I think that we can do that. So it doesn't matter if we're, we know we're called a green chamber. That's fine. We can bring in the, you know, the Glenn's, you know, the, the traditional chambers, you know, because we do know that they're, I mean, look at, look what, what Rick's doing at Jackson Hole. I mean, that's, to me, it's like no different than us calling, you know, us in the green, green chamber industry. I mean, you're doing amazing work. So, so we need to come together. And I think uh, one of you had talked about, you know, the African American chambers, the Hispanic chambers, um, we have LGBTQ chambers, uh, you know, there's so many different other chambers that we need to bring into this mix as well, because they have such great information that we can, again, collectively bring together and share with each other. So um, next slide. Again, this is Amanda's email. If you don't have it, please take it down. Reach out to her. Hopefully we'll bring in new coalition members from today's webinar. We welcome you and we welcome your feedback. You know, if there's something that we can do different with these types of webinars, please let us know. We're going to put together um, a small group to, of chamber leaders that can help guide what type of programming we will do um, as far as getting this out there. It's not about us as the US Green Chamber. It's about us collectively. It's a coalition and we're all in this together. So we just thank you all so much for the time today. And go ahead and next slide. Um, and if you have, go ahead and click it again. <laughs> if you have any, um, any, any information or guidance, just reach out. We thank you so much for taking time out of your Friday, your busy Friday schedule. We really appreciate it and um, thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all.